A critical science lesson that gets left out of a lot of classes is how science actually works. Take a look at this puzzle. See how it's missing a piece? I want you to figure out what that missing piece looks like. Now, if you think that it's a blue rectangle with a face on it, you've got a good hypothesis, but let's run some tests before we jump to any conclusions. Look at the other pieces. See how they all have little faces drawn on them? See how they all fit perfectly into their little slots? We're on the right track, but let's gather multiple lines of evidence. Look at the board itself. All the other pieces have little appendages coming off of them that happen to match the piece in color. And there's writing on the board, too. These are blue, and it says rectangle. So our blue-faced rectangle hypothesis is looking more like a theory. But you weren't there. You never saw the piece in the first place. What, did you meet the guy who made the puzzle or something? You didn't need to. Because science allows us to test the universe around us to gain access to new information that we couldn't have possibly known before. Whether we're calculating the orbit of Pluto or judging a murder trial, just because you've never seen something doesn't mean you can't figure it out. Because I'm about to do a science demonstration inside your brain. I want you to think about the most rotten, nasty, moldy strawberry in the whole world. And it's just sitting there festering with fuzz, and it's got this sickly sweet ooze coming out from around it. And you pick it up, and the vinegary nastiness hits your nose, and you squish it up into your teeth, and it just starts spewing out like pus. And do you feel sick to your stomach right now? You should, because you have this really cool part of your brain called an insular cortex. And it's what's responsible for making you puke whenever you eat, or even think about eating, rotten, nasty food. But it also responds to rotten, nasty behavior. It's the reason why every single language in the world has some sort of phrase like, Ugh, that leaves a bad taste in my mouth, or ooh, that behavior just makes me sick to my stomach. It's because the same part of your brain handles moral and visceral disgust. It's not the only part of your brain that handles morality by a long shot, but it's fun for me because whenever somebody asks, hey, as a scientist, where do you get your morals from? I can say, right here. This is called phenolphthalein. It's a really common pH indicator that's found in just about every chemistry lab and emergency room. And my house. It's cool because it responds to things like this sodium hydroxide solution by turning hot pink. But whenever it's exposed to an acid, it just turns clear. So what do you think is going to happen whenever I introduce a whole bunch of carbon dioxide to the solution? Watch. This is called carbonic acid. It dissolves seashells and it kills coral reefs. When we talk about climate change, we very rarely talk about ocean acidification, but since almost 80% of the oxygen you breathe comes from the ocean, this is a great reason for us to start acting like grown-ups when it comes to taking care of our planet. So I'm trying to eat this sandwich, but I can't stop thinking about mitochondria. I mean, everybody knows they're the powerhouse of the cell, right? Because they convert glucose into ATP, but that's not even close to the coolest thing about them. Did you know that they didn't even start out inside animal cells? About a billion and a half years ago, they were their own independent organisms, swimming around, living life, doing their own thing. And then an animal cell came along and ate one and just didn't digest it. It got protection inside the new cell. The cell got a bunch of energy, so it just kind of kept it around. We call this endosymbiosis. And as a result, almost every single eukaryotic cell has mitochondria. Plants, animals, fungi, you name it. They have their own DNA. That DNA is ring-shaped, which is a prokaryotic thing. They have a double membrane layer from that phagocytosis. They don't even wait for our cells to divide. They divide by themselves all the time. And they're not the only foreign body here. 90% of the cells inside the human body aren't human cells. They're other bacteria, many of which are going to help me digest this sandwich. The fact that we as a colony are going to enjoy this thing is freaking crazy. Polymers are long chain-like molecules made of individual little pieces called monomers, sort of like beads on a string. And for the last decade, my favorite way to introduce them to new students has been with this demonstration right here. You start with three cups, one of which is full of water. And then you play a little game. You have these cups and you mix them all around like this, and you have the kids guess, where did the water go? Well, it's obviously not right here, right? Because you watched me mix them up. And it's certainly not over here, because come on, they're color-coded. But what if I told you that the water wasn't here either? Well, I'd be lying, because of course the water's right here. It's just trapped inside this polymer called sodium polyacrylate. This stuff can absorb over 800 times its own weight in water. It's used in menstrual pads and baby diapers to absorb human fluids, or in agriculture to trap excess rainwater in the soil. Even the most important macromolecules in biology are polymers. DNA, RNA, proteins, carbohydrates, even the plastic that makes these cups is a polymer. If you haven't been blown away by polymers yet, you haven't learned about them yet. So if you've ever been a kid before, you know what it's like to get into an argument with somebody about whether a tomato is a fruit or a vegetable. 
Now imagine how weird it is to grow up to be a biologist and now you know that, yeah, it's a fruit, it grows out of a flower, but it's also actually a berry because it has multiple internal seeds and that's how we separate it from things like this plum, which we call a droop with only one internal seed. There's lots of different subclassifications of berries too, like this apple we would call a palm or this cucumber we would call a peepo. These are both berries. You know what isn't a berry though? This strawberry. This is what's called an aggregate fruit. It's the result of one flower with lots and lots of different carpels that all fuse together once they're fertilized. This red stuff is just weird plant matter. The things that are actually fruits are the things that you would call seeds. Another thing that isn't a berry is this pineapple. This is what's called a multiple fruit because it's a result of multiple flowers fusing together instead of just the carpels of one of them. Every single one of these cells used to be a flower. And if you're noticing a pattern here, yes, every single thing that makes flowers makes fruit too. You've probably picked up on this by now, but one of my biggest pet peeves is when people use science that they don't understand to try to justify their stupidity and hate. And this week I've been told on three separate occasions that homosexuality is wrong because it's unnatural. I'm a biologist, and no it is not. In fact, we've observed homosexual behavior in over 1,500 different animal species. We've seen gay lions and gay dolphins and gay hedgehogs and gay birds and gay fish and even gay insects. In fact, one of our closest living animal relatives, the bonobos, 100% bisexual, across the board. But the fact of the matter is, we don't have a lot of data on how homosexuality works, especially from like an evolutionary perspective. But we have strong evidence that there's a big genetic component to it. And even without that, a behavior that's this ubiquitous across the animal kingdom is clearly of some great ecological importance. So don't throw around words like unnatural when nature itself is proving you wrong. The other day I got hired to teach this high school group about developmental biology and how we can use embryos to kind of learn a little bit more about our own evolutionary past and suddenly I got the worst or maybe best idea that I've had in a long time. You see, when an animal egg is first fertilized, it goes through this period of rapid cell division and you end up with this little cluster of undifferentiated cells. Now the very first thing to develop on that is the digestive tract. It starts as a little dent called a blastopore that then becomes a hollow tube that's still a hollow tube through your body to this day. But there's two kinds of animals in the world. There are the protostomes, where that initial dent is their mouth, and then there's the deuterostomes, where that initial dent is their anus. And you'll never guess what group humans are in. So this got me thinking, right? All my favorite YouTubers and TikTokers, they have like these cutesy little fun names for their subscribers, like Lovelies or Chickadees or Greg. So since there was a time in all of our lives when we were all literally just anuses, what if I started opening all my videos with, what's up assholes, let's talk about science. You know, as a biologist, I find things like conditioner or lotion to be fascinating. I think they're very often taken for granted. Hear me out. See, your body is absolutely covered in bacteria. Bacteria that are specially evolved to eat the sweat and the oils that come out of your sudoriferous and sebaceous glands all day long. In fact, that's where body odor comes from. The bacteria eat these chemicals and then they just poop out bad smells. Do you ever wonder why armpits and feet smell so different? These are different species of bacteria all over your body producing different stinks. So we could just wash them off, right? That makes sense. But the problem is these oils are very important. They waterproof and protect your skin and hair. They're the reason why you don't get all frizzy and dry and cracked and craggy and itchy all the time. So what do we do? We slather ourselves in plant oils, things that these bacteria haven't evolved to be able to digest. I don't know why it tickles me so much to think about the fact that if we didn't understand microbiology and evolution the way we do, we wouldn't know how to look and smell good at the same time. Horsepower has got to be one of the stupidest units of measurement in the entire world. When you buy a car and somebody tells you this car has 160 horsepower in it, you assume that that means that the engine is producing the power of 160 horses to pull the car forward. But no, one horsepower is actually defined as the force that it takes to lift 550 pounds one foot in the air in one second. It was developed back in the 18th century by this guy named James Watt, the namesake of the SI unit of power, the Watt. But it isn't even defined in SI units, so you convert it and you calculate it and you find out that it's actually like 745.7 watts and then you're a biologist and you know a thing or two about horses and you have a real bad insomnia so you do the math and you find out that on average a horse running at full gallop is producing about 15 horsepower so take whatever you think you know about your car and divide that by 15 and then go back to that dealership and say hey you sold me 160 horsepower car you only sold me 10.67 horses where are the rest of my horses